Today I want to look at a pretty interesting approach to defining the trigonometric functions. And well, first we'll define the inverse trigonometric functions via their integral representations, and then define the trig functions sine and cosine to be the inverses of, well, these inverse functions. So this is kind of a backwards or a reverse way of getting at the trig functions. And we'll see by this definition that the properties that we expect for sine and cosine exist. Okay, so let's get to it. So let's notice that arc sine of x is the integral from zero to x of one over the square root of one minus t squared. Arc cosine of x is the integral from x to one of the same function. So that tells us that perhaps we should look at their sum and see what we get. So let's do that. So here we have the sum of arc cosine of x and arc sine of x. Well, notice that's just going to patch these two integrals together to become the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 over the square root of 1 minus t squared dt, just by a fairly simple integral property. Well, we know that right-hand side is a constant. Well, simply because it represents an area under the curve. But what constant is it? Well, let's see if we can evaluate that integral and decide what that constant is. So we're going to use a little bit of a trick here. And that trick is to add the number 0. And we'll add the number 0 in the form of minus t squared plus t squared. So let's take this one and we'll move it over and then let's subtract t squared and then we'll also add t squared. And now let's pull that apart into two integrals. So first we'll have the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 minus t squared over the square root of 1 minus t squared dt. And then we'll have plus the integral from 0 to 1 of well, it'll be t squared over the square root of 1 minus t squared dt, but I'm going to write this as t over the square root of 1 minus t squared times t dt. And that's because to evaluate this second integral, I'm going to use integration by parts. So let's see how we could set that up. Let's maybe take u to be equal to t because when we take the derivative of that, it simplifies. And that's generally a really good rule for integration by parts setup. You should set u equal to something that simplifies under differentiation. OK, so that means that du is simply dt. But then to fill in the rest, we need dv to be, let's see, t dt over the square root of 1 minus t squared. But now we could take the antiderivative of that using u substitution, and it's fairly easy to see that what we get here is v equals minus 1 half times the square root of 1 minus t squared, minus the square root of 1 minus t squared. OK, now let's use our integration by parts formula. But maybe before we do that, let's simplify this first integral. Let's observe that that numerator is 1 minus t squared, but we could rewrite that as the square root of 1 minus t squared quantity squared. And then here we get some cancellation, and we simply have the square root of 1 minus t squared dt. And then we'll have plus, well, what we get from our integration by parts. So we'll have u times v, so that's attached to a minus sign, so we'll have minus t times the square root of 1 minus t squared. We need to evaluate that from t equals 0 to t equals 1. And then we'll have minus the integral of v du. But here the minus signs cancel, giving us plus the integral from 0 to 1 of the square root of 1 minus t squared dt. But now let's observe that this inner thing simplifies that evaluation. If you plug in t equals 1, that becomes 0. If you plug in t equals 0, that becomes 0. So here we get cancellation. So there we get that is equal to 0. But then we can add these two together. Notice that's exactly the same integral. We'll have this is twice 
the integral from zero to one of the square root of one minus t squared dt. But now how can we evaluate that? Well, in fact, we can evaluate it by noticing that it is a certain area. So observe that if we were to set, let's maybe say u equal to the square root of one minus t squared, then we can move some things around and see that we get u squared plus t squared is equal to one. So that means this function represents a curve, which is a quarter circle in the t u plane. So that means this integral represents that area of the quarter circle and that circle has radius one because we have this equation here for a circle of radius one. Well, the area of a quarter circle radius one is pi over four, multiply that by two, we get pi over two. Okay, great. So note, we have arc cosine of x plus arc sine of x is equal to pi over two. Let's see what we can do with that. We just figured out that the sum of these two inverse functions via their integral representations is equal to pi over two. Now let's see what we can do with that to figure out, well, the values of our functions sine and cosine, which is the true goal here. So let's maybe observe that if we set x equal to zero, in this equation right here, we'll have the arc sine of zero, but that's simply equal to the integral from zero to zero, which is zero. So arc sine of zero is zero, and we get arc cosine of zero is pi over two. So let's write that down. So arc uh, cos of zero equals pi over two. But now writing that in terms of our cosine function, that means the cosine of pi over two is equal to zero. Okay, now let's evaluate this at x equals one and see what happens. And then maybe we should fill this in that this also tells us that the arc sine of zero is equal to zero, which means that sine of zero is equal to zero. That's maybe not because of this sum formula we got, but just because of the integral. And then evaluating this at x equals one, notice the arc cosine integral becomes an integral from one to one, which is zero. So we have arc cosine of one is equal to zero, which is the same thing as saying that cosine of zero is equal to one. Okay, so there, we've got another value. But then also that tells us that the arc sine of one is equal to pi over two, plugging it into our sum formula. But that tells us that sine of pi over two is equal to, sine of pi over two is equal to one. So let's maybe put some boxes around this and notice that just by saying that cosine and sine are inverses to these functions defined via integrals, we get some pretty well-known values of cosine and sine. Now let's see if we can figure out the derivative of sine and cosine. So let's maybe set y equal to the sine of x, but that's equivalent to saying that x is equal to the arc sine of y, which is the integral from zero to y of one over the square root of one minus t squared dt. But now we'll take the derivative of both sides with respect to x. So the derivative of the left-hand side with respect to x is simply one. And now we have to use the chain rule to take the derivative of the right-hand side with respect to x. So fundamental theorem of calculus part one or part two, depending on which text you're reading, will give us one over the square root of one minus y squared times y prime. That y prime comes from the chain rule. But now observe that this means that y prime is equal to the square root of one minus y squared. But then putting this all back into the fact that y was equal to sine x, we have the derivative with respect to x of sine of x equals the square root of one minus sine squared of x. Now you might be screaming, oh, that should be cosine of x. But notice that we don't have the Pythagorean trig identity just yet. And now I'll just put similarly here because the calculation is pretty much the same. 
we get the derivative with respect to x of cosine of x is equal to negative the square root of one minus cosine squared of x. And now let's do one more thing here. Let's calculate some second derivatives. Okay, so let's maybe take the second derivative of the sine function, which means we need to take the derivative of this equation. So taking the derivative with respect to x, we'll have y double prime is equal to, so that's gonna give us negative y times y prime over the square root of one minus y squared. But now observe that y prime is the square root of one minus y squared. So that'll actually cancel this denominator and observe that what we get here is that y double prime is equal to negative y. In other words, the derivative with respect to x or the second derivative with respect to x of sine of x is equal to negative sine of x. And then similarly, the second derivative with respect to x of cosine of x is equal to negative cosine of x. But what does that tell us? Well, using the theory of differential equations, that means that the general solution to this differential equation, which is y double prime equals minus y, is y equals a times sine of x plus b times cosine of x. Okay, so here's a summary of what we have. The derivative with respect to x of sine of x is the square root of one minus sine squared. And then the derivative of cosine is the square root of one minus cosine squared. Oh, that should have a minus sign in it. This is minus square root of one minus cos squared x. And then the general solution to the second order differential equation y double prime equals minus y is, well, a linear combination of cosine and sine. And then, well, we're gonna need one more thing to like get off the ground here. So let's notice the following. So let's start with the square root of one minus sine squared x, and let's take the derivative. So let's say this arrow is taking the derivative. But observe from the calculation we already did, we saw that this was minus sine of x. And now let's take the derivative again. So again, we've got an arrow, which means take the derivative. And by this rule up here, that'll be minus square root of one minus sine squared of x. So what does this tell us? Well, observe that we took the second derivative of the square root of one minus sine squared x, and we got negative what we started with. In other words, we got negative the square root of one minus sine squared x. So in other words, the square root of one minus sine squared x is a solution to, well, this general differential equation up here, y double prime minus y. But then furthermore, we know the general solution to this is this linear combination of cosines and sines. But if we've got a solution and we know the general solution, then that means that our solution is one of these general solutions with fixed constants. In other words, we have the square root of one minus sine squared of x is equal to a times cosine of x plus b times sine of x. But now let's square both sides to get rid of the square roots. So we have one minus sine squared of x is equal to, well, that's gonna be a squared cos squared. And then we'll have plus two a b, and then we'll have cos x sine x. And then finally we'll have plus b squared sine squared x. And now we'll use the fact that sine of zero is equal to zero. Remember, we derived that on a previous board. So if we plug in x equals zero, that's gonna collapse to one equals a squared because this sine term will go to zero. This one will and this one will, leaving us with a squared cosine squared. But we also derived that cosine of zero must be equal to one. So check it out. We know that a squared is equal to one. But in fact, that means that a is equal to plus or minus one, but 
We don't even need to know which one it is, plus or minus one. What we'll do is observe that if a squared is equal to one, oh, and I guess before we get ahead of ourselves, notice that plugging in x equals pi over two into this whole thing will have like a similar simplifying effect using the fact that cosine of pi over two is zero and sine of pi over two is one, we'll see that zero is equal to b squared. Okay, but again, that means that b is equal to zero. And finally, plugging that into the equation that we have above, we get this simplified equation, one minus sine squared is equal to cosine squared. In other words, we have our Pythagorean trig identity, cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to one. So this is what we got so far, our derivatives, our Pythagorean trig identity, and some values. So now let's plug some of this stuff in. So notice that we know the derivative with respect to x now of sine of x is equal to, well, the square root of one minus sine squared, but that's gonna be the square root of cosine squared x. And now technically that's the absolute value of cosine of x. But I'm just gonna take the positive root so we get the cosine of x. So there we have it. The derivative of sine of x is equal to cosine of x. And then likewise, we can have the derivative of cosine of x equals negative sine of x, plugging that stuff in as well. Now, you might say, well, what about some other values that would have helped us choose whether or not we take the positive or negative of the absolute values? Well, you can get some other values of sine and cosine by deriving double angle identities and other multiple angle identities. But you can actually do that with all of the parts that we've derived so far. So I'll leave that to you for a little bit of a homework exercise. And that's a good place to stop.